Welcome back to the podcast. I'm Tom. And I'm Joe. And this is Inside a Mind. This is episode seven, and we hope you are as excited for it as we are. We are joined today by someone whose thoughts have inspired thousands of people around the world and a personal idol of mine. This is Matty Wilson. Before we dive deep into conversation and we get stuck on the podcast and going all around, could you tell the viewers a bit about you and a bit about your story? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, in a nutshell, um, I'm a, a digital marketing agency owner. So that's my main business. I run an agency. I've been into marketing now for quite like 14 years now. I've been doing it, I think, which makes you feel old. But, um, you know, I'm 37, got three kids, I had, had three kids when I was very young. Uh, I was 24 when I had my third one. I'm married, uh, run an event called EMC. That's about it in a nutshell, mate. You know? mate it's a good yeah. good resume to have. Yeah. I think with podcasts like this, is it's so like nice to get an hour to talk to someone like yourself and really have the conversations we don't really get to have if I was to meet you like at EMC, etc. So the... when, when we met drunk at a party. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great way to meet. Yeah, we were but... drunk at a party and you cut to me just after I'd gone, gone to the toilet. As so I was like, yeah, I'll come on your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's a way to do it. Yeah, was, for sure, I mate. Yeah, the get... bar. I was like, you know what? Yeah. I'm going to go chat to my Yeah, for sure, like, mate. Guy. Absolutely, it works. <laughs> but the, where, <laughs> where I wanted to start was sort of, can we go back to, go back to the start? You know, go back to Matty growing up. Where about uh-huh. are you from? And let's talk about your story growing up yeah so i'm from a, a little town in uh, in kent called gray's ends um you know it's not the greatest of places really it's home obviously that's where I'm, it's, you know i love it because it's where all my family's from and and where i grew up but you know it's you know working class sort of town you know a bit rough around the edges and and things like that i was always um you know i was always a little bit of a a rebel, I suppose, you know, when I was younger, I was a bit naughty in school, you know, I hated, I hated school, I hated authority at the time, thought I knew it all, you know, didn't want to learn from anybody, if someone told me what to do, I was, my attitude at that point was like, you know, what do you know, you know, I thought I knew everything, classic, classic sort of, classic sort of teenage lad, really, Um, and yeah, you know, fr- from there, I-, I left school very, very early. I-, I I didn't get any, you know, qualifications, any GCSEs or anything like that. I left school straight away. I just wanted to earn money. We didn't have any money growing up. So the first thing I wanted to do was was earn money as quick as I could. So I was straight on the building site, right? Because it's just jobs like that going all the, all, the, all the time in Grey's End. And straight away got into a job um, uh, like labouring for a bricklayer. Then I was... Um, then I was roofing for a little while. Then I was fitting windows, you know, just loads of different jobs between sort of the age of, um, I'd say, 15 up to about, you know, 18. And then um, I was getting in a bit of trouble, you know, with the, with, no, they're just the crowd I was hanging around with weren't a good crowd, you know. They, they, I mean, they're nice guys, but they wasn't, you know, they weren't going anywhere, right? Loads of them had kids really young already that they and they weren't seeing the kids they was all you know smoking weed doing drugs all this sort of stuff and it i was just in with a little bit of a bad crowd and i got in a bit of trouble with the police um when i was uh when i was 18 and this is when emily my now wife was pregnant with our first kid ben and um that we were and we was living at our mum's still as well and i got arrested you know spent the night in a cell and all this sort of stuff my old man picked me up and then I come back to uh, my mum's house and my mum was like, you know, you've got to sort yourself out. If you don't get a job working with your dad, I'm kicking you out and you're on your own sort of thing, like a bit of an ultimatum, you know. Yeah. So then that led me to work with my dad. My dad at the time was working in a factory um, making plastic film. It was like food pack for food packaging. You know those fucking annoying packs of bacon you can't open? Yeah. yeah, yeah, that was me. I used to make that shit, right? So that was, that was what I used to make. And these massive four-story machines it was like a really hot um uncomfortable place like hard work it was 12-hour shifts days and nights um but I really sort of like learned to appreciate the work because you know I was I was 19 at this point now and I was probably making like maybe 30 grand a year which for for someone where I'm from was a lot of money yeah, and my age, sure. like no one my age was making that money. I, 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 bearing in mind, I was working every hour under the sun though, because obviously we'd now got a, you know we'd now got a house and I've got I've got a kid, and um, you know I actually like really enjoyed it. But it was like it was there actually, you know. I'd always tell this story. It was it was in that factory where 
you know, if, if I could sort of like say a point where my life went in a completely different direction, it was working in that factory because there was a couple, well, a couple of reasons why. It was, first of all, my old man, my dad, working so closely with my dad, I learned a lot of stuff from him that he didn't like necessarily, you know, consciously teach me. But one thing was like work ethic. He just worked so hard. And the other thing was leadership because although my dad at the time wasn't a manager, you know, he wasn't a, you know, one of those people, I looked around and I just noticed I was observing everybody else on the crew, all of their like the way they sort of look at my dad and all of them looked at him like a leader. They all gave him so much respect because, just because, simply because, he worked harder than all of them. And I sort of like picked up on that and that was a big sort of like lesson for me because I was like, okay, cool. So if you work really hard and you lead from the front, if you do do the work, people will naturally follow you. You'll be that person. He ended up being like, um, you know, the the foreman of that factory after by the time I left. So that was one like really important lesson. But then the other big thing was that, you know, I didn't want to be in a place for the rest of my life if I didn't love it. And what happened was, I remember I was um, I was in the smoking booth. This was like pre smoking <laughs> ban, right? Fuck knows, you know, two thousand five or whenever this was. And and there was this there was a couple of guys in there, and they was just bitching about the the place, right? The work. They was just yeah, this place, mate, it's rub. Oh, they don't care about you. It's all bollocks, you know. And they were just like going off, and I was just sit, sort of sitting there, yeah, yeah, you know, sort of agreeing with them. And then I can remember looking at one guy. His name was Dave. He was probably like you know mid fifties, late fifties. Dave. Dave, yeah, <laughs> good, yeah, is it right, Dave? He was probably like mid fifties to late fifties. And I remember saying to him, I said, Dave, how long have you been here? Because I genuinely didn't know. And he looked at me and he was like, I've been here 35 years or 36 years or something like that. And I can remember that moment so clearly in my mind because it scared the shit out of me. Yeah. I it, like It just suddenly come over, like this massive fear come over me of like, I could end up like that. Now, there's nothing wrong with working in a place like that if you love it. My old man loved it, right? Fair play to him, and he was great. It never bitched, never moaned about it. It was a great job, but why? And I just looked at him. I was like, "Why are you still here? If you hate this place that much, and this place is so bad to you, and it's so unfair, and it's all this sort of stuff, why are you still here?" Because my attitude was never like that. I'd at this point, I'd had like six jobs. I'd lo- I'd, I'd I'd work in the job. I love it. If I get to a point where I feel myself bitching or moaning about. It, I'm out. I, I just move on, get another job. Life's too short, and all this sort of stuff. And I can remember that moment because it was like a moment where I was like. Yeah, I'm not going to end up like that. If I ever get to a point where I'm bitching and moaning about a situation, I'm going to do something to change it. How old were you at that point? So that was I was like that, that was I was probably 20 when that happened. That's a good good age to like sort of have that epiphany as well. It's like, yeah, I made mean, for sure. So many years. Yeah, ahead, yeah, yeah, sort of yeah, yeah for sure. Because loads of people, you know, like mo- a lot of people, they'll they'll go through they'll go through their whole lives without realizing that. Coming you know? back to the school point, and I find it really interesting because I wasn't great at school. Like, yeah. I actually did quite well sort of when it came to academics because I sort of had this like hyper focused type thing on my ADHD mm. where I could, was able to sort of lock in and, and get it done at the last minute. Yeah. But like, I was never like the best behaved. I was always in a trouble and stuff like that. And that kind of resonates with me. Yeah. You said you dropped out of school. What sort of like didn't you like about the authority of school? And was it just the whole structure as a whole or was it, you know, you, it was more nature versus nurture? You in the, you were in a bad crowd and that pushed you that way? Yes, good question. I, um, it's pr- it was probably authority, definitely. I hated being told what to do. I hated being made to do something I didn't want to do. So I hated the fact that I had to be there or I'd get in trouble. Like that to me is like a cage, mm-hmm. you know, doing something that I don't want to do. Um, but mainly it was money. It was like, I don't, I don't, I, I, I don't want to be doing this stuff. I, I need money because, again, we didn't have any. Like I didn't have anything, you know. I can still remember... Like when I was younger, all my friends, you, you boys might be a bit too young to remember, but it was just like craze when I was probably like early teens. And there was like the Adidas popper tracksuit bottoms, right? Three stripes and they popped open and they had buttons all the way down the side. They were the coolest things ever. And all of my friends fucking had these trousers. Oh, I didn't have them. I had like two stripes, you know, it was horrible. And and I can remember my mum actually treated me one day. I actually, she brought me a pair and it was a 
best thing ever. I wore them every single day. Problem was, I made of this shitty nylon, and I, by, by about <laughs> three months into it, there was just holes everywhere, and I couldn't afford another pair. You know, so a, a big a big driver was money. I just wanted to get out and actually just make some money. Yeah. You know, I knew because of my grades, I knew that I weren't getting into university. Yeah. I couldn't. That just wasn't an option because I didn't have the, the grades to do that. And like, you know, I didn't want to go to college and, you know, learn a trade and all this sort of stuff. So I just decided to, you know, just, just go at it and just, just get a job and earn some cash. Yeah. When it came to authority, how did you find being in the workplace versus school? Because taking orders from someone who's above you when you came to the workplace, how did you find that compared to being at school? I, I didn't mind that because again, it wasn't as bad. It, yeah, well. it wasn't, I'm being paid. Yeah. It wasn't as bad. Most of the time it's a bit of banter as opposed to like, you know, a teacher telling you off like you're an infant. Yeah. Uh, so I didn't mind that too much, to be honest. You know, don't you know? Don't get me wrong. I had a couple of clashes with a couple of, um, you know, like managers and supervisors and all that stuff through the years. But for the most part, I didn't mind it. That's right. Yeah. Fair enough. Do yeah. you think sort of like education as a whole is important, or do you reckon you know the path you took? Because we had Christian Scales on. He was a, a Crystal Palace footballer. Was the most I saw important. it. I, I watched it. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Yeah. And he was basically saying like. He sacked off education. He was like, I'm a footballer. He was like, I'm making, making yeah. money. This is it. And then when he sat here, he's 27 now, 26, 27. He was yeah. like, I kind of wish I, you know, just carried on, even if it was just like doing B-Tech or something, because he had no qualifications. What's your view on that? You, are you are you like education as a whole? Nah. Or, I, I, I think, I think, views. I think school's important um, to, for, for all kids, but not for, not for academic reasons, I don't think. Like, you know, for, for obviously for some people, if they want to do, you know, if they want to be a lawyer or a doctor or something like a profession like that, obviously, yeah. But I don't think, I, I've, I, I've got three kids and I think, I think school's really, really important for social skills, communication skills, confidence you know, being able to hold your own in different environments and different situations that come up at school, that's why it's important. I don't think that the stuff they teach in school is, is necessary. I, I, I think that you've got to learn that sort of stuff. But like, you know, having a graded system which can affect a an employer hiring you, I don't think is right. I know for a fact now I could pretty much get any job I wanted to get job because I would get in as long as I got the interview if I got the interview I would 100% get hired yeah because I believe in myself so much I'm a great communicator I can talk right I can sell and I and I think that the, that confidence is all all that people want to know because I'm a boss you know I've got nine employees I know what people want really all they want to know is that someone is going to be willing to learn and they're going to work hard that's it because at the end of the day, just because I've got a, let's say I had a, you know, a, a degree in maths, right? And then I go get a job and yeah, that's important. But most of the job, you don't need that stuff that you learned in your degree. Right. It, you don't need that right. stuff. You're going to be talking to people. You're going to be following a system that someone's going to teach you anyway. But the degree is like, oh yeah, he's got a degree so he can learn. No, anyone could learn it. But the problem is that's like a big sort of... Um, it's like a big barrier for people hiring people. And I think that's wrong. 100%. I think I think more employers should look at the person because the, uh, how I always say it is I value common sense over intelligence. I would trade common sense for intelligence any day of the week, any day of the week. Mm -hmm. You give me common sense over a degree, you know, anytime. Because I know, that, again, working with smart people, you know, you give them simple tasks where they have to make a simple decision, which is a common sense based decision, and they get it wrong because it's not analytical and they can't figure it out. There's not a formula for it. It's just a decision. You just got to make the decision. True. And, it, and that takes common sense. And that's the most valuable skill, I think, you know. But I think it, we, we've got to have, kids have got to go to school, obviously. I'm not saying that. All my kids' school, but it, like my son's just finished his um, GCSEs. Just finished him. He's got his results and he he done great, like all bees. And, you know, he was freaking out a little bit a couple of months ago. And I said, look, mate, just so you know, I don't give a fuck what your grades are. Do not work yourself up. Just do your best and it doesn't matter. I'm telling you now, no matter what your grades are, you're going to be fine because you're confident, you can talk to people, you're, you know, he's, and he's got common sense. That's all that matters. So, and I definitely don't agree with like parents, you know, pressuring kids to do well in school and all this. Cause I don't think honestly, grades are, they're pointless. It's a shame that so many employers now look, I've never looked at a CV in my life. 
Yeah. Ever. You just hire off. Never. I, I just get them in the interview. Yeah. And what my team does is they'll look at it in terms of, you know, are they all right? And then get them in. I don't want to see it. I don't want to make any prejudgments because none of it matters. Just get them, in, get them in front of me and let me see what they're made of. You it's know? really interesting, actually, because well, I went to a school where I was one of maybe three or four people that didn't go to university. Yeah. I like, genuinely threw an entire year group. And I was like, it's not for me. Because I, I didn't exam well at all. I knew all the answers, but I just couldn't mm. put it down on paper. So yeah. when I got my results back, I thought, I, I knew all the answers, but I just couldn't. But I, it's neurodiversity isn't isn't catered for school kids. You know, I'm Tom and I are the same thing, probably you as well. Like, yeah. you, you knew all the answers, but you couldn't put it down to paper. Yeah. So when I didn't go, people really couldn't understand why. And yeah. the parents were like, why wouldn't Joe go to university? And I yeah. wanted to get into my own business and yeah. start my own thing up. And I've been doing it for 10 plus years since then. So yeah. same as you, most people that I know who examined really well couldn't cope in, the, in a, an interview situation. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. But what well, yeah, that was the what well, was used to piss me off that what you just said. That was <laughs> I used to get an answer right, and then they 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 would they would score it wrong because I didn't put the formula down of how I worked it out. So I don't know how I worked it out. Yeah, I did it all in my head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And as well because like what what schools need to they're, they're so behind schools. Like you know what what it is it's, it is broken because what they what they've got to do is they have to profile each kid first, and they have to teach everyone in a different way. Like I was dyslexic, right? Bit of ADHD, obviously, and you know, my 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 attention was never there because I'm a dreamer. But that doesn't mean I'm not smart. That just means I drift off because I can't look. If you put a load of paper with lines of writing in front of me, I get yeah. overwhelmed. I get distracted, and I start drifting off. I paint pictures in my head. If you draw me a picture of how that fucking works, I'll get it like that. I understand now. Yeah, yeah, Get on a whiteboard and show me. And I understand, oh, okay, yeah, got it. Someone does this with their hands and they're doing, I can understand that. You give me a sheet of A4 paper with Words. a fucking load of what I'm like, yeah. what the fuck? I don't even want to read Same it. Even with emails. If I get an email that's too long, I say to, I say to my PA, can you just tell me what that means? Because it, it overwhelms me. Yeah. I can't like look at too many words, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and there's loads of different... There's loads of different, you know, like learning abilities and all that sort of stuff. And they need to be in different environments, but everyone's wedged into the same thing, which is an old school, you know, early 1900s way of teaching. Mm. That they're like the academic way with books and like words and writing and all that sort of stuff. With like the technology and stuff that we've got now and computers and screens and shit, it should be a lot more advanced than what it is, but they're still so far behind, 100%. you know? 100%. How was this for you, like school as a whole, like mentally? Because I know for, well, I, I think I can speak for Joe as well, is like I literally felt like when we were running through books, nothing was going in. I was trying, but just like, like you said then, if someone was to teach me in a different way, it was easy. And that led to me like incredibly stressed out, gave me like really bad anxiety through school. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of people in that position, I'd love to hear like, did that have the same effect on you or were you just a bit like, actually, you know what? Yeah, I, I I can relate to it. I can uh, you know I can I can relate to it. But for me personally, it, I, I, it never bothered me to the point where I was ever stressed or worried. I just didn't. I, yet again, I was a shit. I I just didn't care. My attitude was I don't give a fuck. I don't know how I got the grades I did. <clears throat> I got a couple of C's and I got a B, which was remarkable because I didn't read a book. I didn't attend most of the classes, you know. But I I I luckily never let it get me stressed out. What you find is the people that it stresses out the most are the ones that are really fucking trying to do it, the ones that are putting the work in. Like my son, you know, he was getting a little bit stressed out. He's, he's, I don't know where he's from, you know. It's, it's like, <laughs> he, he, he's, he's always done so well in school. We've never had to make, because again, we're not that type of parents. We won't push him to do homework. He just, he's always done it. We've never asked him. He's like got predicted A's and B's for everything in school. So where the fuck has he know. done that, right? But again... He's he he did get to a point where he was letting it stress him out a little bit much, you know, to the point where you know he had a conversation with me. He's just like, you know, it's getting to me now. What if I don't get the grades? It don't matter, mate. It doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. Um, another thing, I, I put out a little poll on my Instagram where I have a few followers who you know ask certain questions, and when I talked about your story um, a couple of weeks back, one of the questions was, do you think you can truly be hungry unless you've experienced adversity in life? And that like sort of stuck me, and I was like, "That's a perfect question to ask Matty when he's on." Mm. And what's what's your view on that? Um, uh, yeah, I, I think you can absolutely. I honestly do. You know, I know I know people that have come from much more comfortable backgrounds than I did with money and stuff. They just have different drivers. Mm. You know, their 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 main their main driver psychologically will be to prove, to outwork, to outperform dad, for example, right yeah. or whatever. But they can definitely 100% still be just as hungry as we can. Where we ju we just come from a a bit more of a um, 
you know, almost like a scarcity background. It's like we're doing it because we want what we've never had. Mm. You know, what they're probably trying to do and, and where they find their hunger and drive from is trying to outwork what whoever has already had, you know. But yeah, I, I definitely think you can. If your motivator originally was money, when you first started making money, like actual money, what, what did it continue to be money after you started making it or was it then? No, nah, the yeah, that's a really good question actually. No, it didn't. It, it, it definitely changed. It may be probably... Um, you know, sort of like five years ago, maybe it really switched for me because you know I was I was earning really good money, business was doing well. I was I got to a point where you know if I if I if tomorrow I wanted to go to Vegas, you know, business class or whatever, I could just do it at the drop of a hat. If one of my mates said, "Yeah, do you want to go thingy next week?" I'd be like, "Yeah, sweet." Got to a point where I could do it. I, I you know I'm not one of these people that needs like a massive house you know, five Ferraris on the thing. I've never been like that just anyway. Three. Just three, yeah. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it's weird. It, it just changed to, like, my, my main focus always now, The how I gauge it isn't necessarily how much money I'm making. It's always how happy I am. Okay. That's my gauge. Yeah. You know, my gauge is, um, you know, do I want to get up and go to work? Do I, Am I happy doing what I'm doing right now? Do I want to be here? All of those types of little gauges, you know, things like that. Am I happy with my body right now, where my health is? Am I happy with my social life? Am I happy with my relationship? And I just sort of like look at those factors really now, you know, and try not to focus necessarily on the materialistic stuff and getting the money in. Although that's very, very important yeah. because it's one of the most important things, without a doubt, because without that, all of that stuff is way know. harder. Yeah. You know, but it just means that I don't I don't just purely focus on doing it like, you know, in my early 20s, mid 20s, late 20s. That that was just that was it. That's all I was thinking about. You just spoke then about your physical fitness. I know that's mm. that's big for you. You had your online coach speak at EMC. Kirk Miller. Yeah. Yeah. Kirk Miller. Obviously, Joe, that's what Joe's in. Joe's a PT. Joe is huge on sort of fitness. And, you know, we both are in a way of in happy body, like happy mind. And I'm a big believer in that. And yeah. especially like for me, physical activity, if I can exercise and have a good fitness regime and we both play rugby. So do I. Oh, really? Yeah. You're playing at the moment? Or? Uh, mate, I've, I've literally found out yesterday I've got to have an ankle operation on the 5th of November. It's quite a bad one. What do you do? So, I had an ankle operation. So, so I had an MRI last week and it t I've, got a bit, I've got a bone fragment stuck in my ankle. Oh, really? And it's really, mate, it's been like six months now. And Because with private healthcare, they, before they send you to like, especially they put you through like physio. I know my body and I was saying to these physios, look, there's something bad wrong with it. This elastic band you're fucking giving me ain't going to do shit. <laughs> I need to go and see a yeah, professional yeah. about my ankle. Yeah. Finally went and saw one and he was like, yeah, it's fucked. And then we need to get you in for an MRI. And then, yeah, there's a bone fragment in it. So they've got to remove that. But I have to wear a boot for like six That's weeks. Yeah, so I'm out. I can't play till January now. So I'm gutted. Where is it you're playing at the moment? Uh, Gravesend. Gravesend, yeah, Gravesend. Oh, for old Grays Indians, but in Gravesend, yeah. Do you enjoy it still? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I, I stopped playing first team last year. Yeah, I, I've just gone down to the seconds, like because my body's just like gets in bits playing at one's level. They always call me up, but I'm just like, mate. Yeah. Well, at first when I was trying to play twos, I, I would just get kept getting called up to the ones, and then I was just like, last year I made a decision. I was like, no. No, I'm not. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna be rude and tell you no every time. I'm not playing ones anymore, because my body just like the way I play. I'm not a technically good player. I just run straight Thank through people, know. and because our, our levels like you know we're in this Kent ones. It's like the highest the highest level in Kent. It's like they're fitter, they're big, they're strong. When they hit me, although it's fine on the day, the next day I'm like. I'm <laughs> my beard. going to twos twos level mate, they just move out of my way it's brilliant yeah. and when they do hit me they're soft as shit so it's like I wake up the next day I'm fine so I'm like I love playing rugby but I'm, I'm only doing it at twos level now you know what other stuff do you do <laughs> what other stuff do you do in terms of like gym wise I know you use Kirk and his, his program what type of stuff does that like involve yeah I mean like uh, like recently uh, yeah, it's been very limited because of my ankle so I, I, every morning Monday to Friday anyway I do a 5k jog you know very slow 35 40 minutes so not nice slow pace and then i'll hit the gym um do some weights full body stuff um try to hit every sort of muscle group and then in the sauna and in the sauna for 20 minutes cold shower 
for 10 seconds <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, and then and then I'm into the office have you yeah. done a lot of like cold water things I'm trying to do it and we spoke about this before I literally sit in like an ice bar yeah just can't bring myself I'm, Mate, I'm getting it, better with it though. it's um better. yeah it's great like all the Wim Hof stuff I've been on a few of it so I can you know I've I've, I've learned how to do it now there's 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 te- like techniques breathing techniques and oh, stuff really? you can master it yeah so I went on a Wim Hof retreat and they teach you like the breathing technique and stuff you do before you get in there so when I get in now, I can get in. I'm not, you know, I'm not yeah, that now. I can get in just, and I'm just in there calm and collected. You it know? does wonders for like my mental, like, especially when I'm in like a stressful situation. If you, if I work all day yeah. and I just, I'm just stressed out, just doing that, it makes me feel great afterwards. So any advice afterwards would, would be very helpful. Yeah. Um, the next area we wanted to touch on was, this is something you spoke about briefly at EMC, but I also read about you and you're, you're very big on like personal development. And you're big on people like Tony Robbins and the advice that these guys yeah. uh, provide. Mm-hmm. What can you tell the viewers about like what type of advice these guys have, have given to you? Because now I guess the torch has been passed and I look at people like yourself and the people at EMC who, who provide this value. Yeah, man. I mean, just 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 consume as much of it as, as you possibly can. You know, I listen to every morning when I'm on that jog. So that's forty minutes, and then I'm in the gym for probably another forty-five. That whole time, I'm listening to motivational videos on YouTube. I go onto YouTube, search for motivational videos, whack the first one on, just let it play. And it just, it, you know, there's nothing bad about that because it's just filling your mind with really good positive shit, you know, mo- just motivation stuff. But then also, if you want to get like deeper into it, you know, you go down Tony Robbins' route and really sort of start learning. If I could go back and go to university, for example, what and, and I was allowed to study one subject, it would be psychology. That would be my subject because well, like human, psychology. human psychology, because that's actually you know although you know I've been marketing I'm known for for being a marketer if you like and helping companies you know run ads and all that sort of stuff the the thing that I've studied the most out of everything more than sales which I studied a shitload more than marketing is is psychology mm. and 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 knowing how your own brain works so like robins will go deep into some of that stuff so you can really start understanding it because most people they they don't understand the real reasons why they're not doing the things that they should do, why they are doing the things that they shouldn't do. They don't understand that because they're not self-aware. And they're not self-aware because they don't understand how the brain works. So once you understand, for example, like when you know, when you go into like subconscious and you and you like Robbins talks about that a lot, you know, and and like um, you know, Napoleon Hill, for example, think and grow rich. If you if you if you go in and un- start understanding the power that the subconscious mind, your subconscious minds has over you, it will blow you away. How I try to explain it, I've been really trying to, over the last sort of year, I've been trying to get this out of my head. So sorry if it comes across a little bit disjointed, but there's there's potentially a book in this. I'm trying to get it out. <laughs> but the way the way I look at it is that there's there's two. The, the, imagine two uh, people in your head, right? You've got a really big like Arnold Schwarzenegger looking guy mm. and then you've got like a really small tiny very quiet like Danny DeVito looking guy right he's really small insignificant that's what it's like it's, con- it's co- like conscious mind subconscious mind right these two things and what happens for most people is when they say yeah I'm going to go to the gym tomorrow and then tomorrow comes round and they get up and they say and in in their head the Arnold Schwarzenegger looking guy he says something like um, oh yes all right it's a little bit cold outside you just wait till tomorrow you know he says that and then Danny DeVito looking guy he's down there he's saying no he's fucking you, you're just saying that because you, you you don't want to get up and go to the gym you lazy fucker get up and go to the gym you can't hear him because he's too he's too small he's too quiet this other guy's too big as you become more aware of your own subconscious and like the other the, both of those voices inside your head the real reason is Danny DeVito he's telling you the truth the other guy's lying to you Danny DeVito is trying to tell you the truth it's like it's just an excuse you're just doing that because you're lazy but you can't hear him once you can hone into it a little bit and you listen to him once he gets a little bit stronger and then the other guy gets a little bit smaller and then the more and more you listen to that guy and do the things that he's telling you to do, he gets stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger until they reverse. Like my brain at the moment is that my truth, my actual subconscious mind, he's massive, he's huge, he's loud, he's big, mass, massive, muscly guy. And my other guy who's still there, you can never get rid of him. 
ever. You can't kill him. He's always there. This is the guy with all the bad thoughts. This is the guy that that will tell you not to do stuff. This is the guy that will like tell you to kill yourself. This is the guy that will do all of this other stuff. He's still there. And you can never get rid of him. But now this guy's so much stronger. So when he pipes up, he just punches him in the head or whatever, right? It's like an internal battle all of the time. Problem is, everybody, most people. They're walking around, it's the other way around. So they can't hear this guy and they refuse to listen to him because this guy's saying, yeah, he's a liar. He's a liar. He's, no, no, of course you can lay in bed. It's just, you're cold, you can go tomorrow. It's a liar, right? And then, so, and that's that's self-awareness. What, what I'm trying to explain, that's self-awareness. It's like a visual way, again, I'm visual, visual way to explain self-awareness. It's being able to hear this guy. That's self-awareness, knowing the real reason why you're not doing the things that you should, why you are doing the things that you shouldn't. It's being able to hone in. So listening to all this stuff, listening to Robbins and all of that sort of stuff over the years has made me very, very self-aware. That's the one gift it's given me, mm-hmm. self-awareness. I, can't, I cannot bullshit myself now. If I want to try something new and I don't, I can lie about it for a little while, but then as soon as I hear this voice, because again, I'm honed in on this now, as soon as I hear the guy that tells the truth say, no, you're just doing it because you're scared you're going to fail. You're scared of failure. Then I go, I ain't fucking scared of failure. Fuck that, I'm going to do it. Because I can't, the truth now pisses me off. Whereas this guy's saying, oh yeah, no, no, yeah, just wait till everything's perfect. You know, 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 do this, do that, all this sort of stuff. The real reason is because I'm scared of failing. And as soon as I admit that, I then know that that's the real reason I'm not doing it. And I don't accept that. Yeah, where other people, they won't accept that they're scared of failing. They'll make up all this other shit that this guy's telling them and they'll listen to that, yeah. you know? How do you sort of combat that? Because I feel like, yeah, I, now you've explained it, it actually makes a lot of sense, like how my how my head works. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of the time is when I get that voice is in the gym, when you're under a heavy weight and you've got like three more reps and yeah. you're just like, no one's watching, I, I can just do one more. <coughs> yeah. And recently I've been like avidly making sure I do every single rep, even yeah. if I'm in there longer than everyone else, more to just prove to myself that I'm not like mentally weak. Yeah. And that's so funny you said that. It's literally been the last six months I've been, you know, it's not really a journey, but like changed that mindset. If someone's starting out there who's in that space that I was in about six months ago yeah. and you were at one point, what would you say is like the best place to start? Would you go for a mindset coach or would you literally just get on YouTube and just start learning about it yourself? Yeah, just, just mate, just start, yeah, like, let's just, again, motivational videos, just that, just on YouTube will teach you a lot. If you can just fill your brain with some of that stuff every day, that's great. But yeah, more detailed stuff like, you know, old school stuff, Zig Ziglar, Tony Robbins, Brian Tracy. I've listened to everything any of those guys have ever sold. I've got it all. You know, that stuff really helps because it's really, they'll explain it. But the biggest bit of advice I can give is everyone can hear it. Everyone can hear that voice, but they just, they lie to themselves. Yeah. You know, that's it. And it's just getting real fucking honest with yourself. Remember when I was 29, I was like really good at marketing. I was doing all this stuff, but I was behind the scenes. I was running a company for another guy, seminar events company. We used to teach public speaker training. I knew that I wanted to start getting out there. I wanted to start doing videos because I was seeing all these other people doing videos online and Instagram and Facebook and doing all this stuff. And I was like, I know my craft better than any of these guys. I can talk better. And this is what I'm telling myself. I can do it so much better than them and all this sort of stuff. I'm going to do it. And then it's like, yeah, but I'll wait till I get a really good camera first. And then I'll, oh yeah, no, but now I've got the camera, the mic and the lighting's got to be good and all this sort of shit. Oh yeah, I can't do it now because I've got all this stuff to do. And it's lies and lies and lies, excuses, excuses. I then turned 30. 30th was a big sort of turning point in my life as well. This really, this really sort of shifted me again here because when I when I turned 30, it was the it was the first time ever that I could remember my dad turning that age. Mm. So for example, I couldn't remember my dad turning 29. I couldn't remember his 29th birthday, couldn't remember his 28th, 24th, 23rd, although I was there, I couldn't remember it. But I vividly remembered his 30th birthday because I was 10. I remembered it. I remembered the banner, the balloons, where it was. Now I'm 30 and I was like, fuck, I'm the same age as my dad. That's like what went through my head and it scared me because that was the first time I started to realize how short life is, like really. All of the bullshit mortality was just out the window. Immortality was out the window. It was just like mortality's here. I was like, fuck, I'm getting old. And five years have gone by now where I've been saying I'm gonna do that 
start putting stuff out there, start building a bit of a profile, start speaking on stages, start doing this sort of stuff. Five years I've been talking about doing it and that's gone now. And I was like, why Why is that? What's the fucking real reason? So I had to get really deep and do some really sort of like self-work and figure what it, out what it was. And it was, and again, this is again, all comes from self-awareness. I really had to listen to what the reason was. And it was the fact that I was scared about what other people would think. It was, and it was like, and when I, but again, when I realized it and, and, and admitted it to myself, I, I wouldn't have it. I was like, that's the reason? Fuck that. But that was a controlling factor of why I hadn't done it for five years. A hundred percent. So then I got real deep and I was like, okay, but so who is it that I'm scared will think something? Because all my family and everyone like that, they'll be supportive. So who is it? You know, who is it just strangers? But I don't know those people. That nobody's going to see them. Like, why do I care about those people? And then I actually, when I come, it was really weird. I actually figured it out again. I went really internal and figured it out. It was people I used to go to school with. It was my old crowd. It was the bad crew. Mm. It was those guys. I pictured. I figured out. I was picturing them seeing it on Facebook. It's like you seen Matt. Look at his prick. You know what's he doing? You know that sort of thing. That's what I was. But it was very, very subconscious. So I weren't admitting that that was the reason. But once I done some self work and I was like, well, I've got to figure out why I'm not doing this. What's the barrier? What's the what's that, what's the thing that's holding me back? I figured out it was that and went real deep. And I was like, that's ridiculous yeah. because I don't even see those people anymore. Yeah. You know, funny thing is they a lot, lot a few of the people messaged me and they're just like, mate, love your videos. Doing all when I first started doing it. But the point was because I figured it out. And then got real honest with myself and admitted that that was the reason. My brain then wouldn't let me not do it because I was like, just like when when I admit that actually it's because I'm scared of failing. And I know, I know because I preach it all the time that failure is actually nothing to be scared of at all. So if that's ever the reason, I'm like, well, no, fuck that. I'm doing it then. If that's the real reason and it's not all this other shit that my brain has been telling me, then I'm going to do it because that's fine. If it's because I'm scared of what people think that I don't even see anymore, if that's the real reason, then I'm going to do it because that's nothing to be scared of. And then from 30 onwards, I just literally, and it was, mate, it was like a weight was lifted. I dropped every bit of baggage I ever had about what other people think about me. I don't care anymore. And I know because I used to be the guy in my 20s that would say it. I know everyone says it. Oh, yeah, I don't care what people think. Everybody does. Everybody does. Now, there's some people, you've got to care what people think. Like, don't get me wrong. I, I care what my family think of me. I care what my kids think of me, what my wife thinks. Of. That's important. If they start saying I'm being a dick or like, mate, you're, you know, you've been a bit of a prick lately or whatever. I, that's saying I need to pay attention to. But if some troll with a, you know, a, a, a water bottle as a profile picture on fucking Facebook comments on one of my ads calling me a wanker and a liar and a scammer, I don't care because I know, I know myself so well, I know I'm not any of that stuff. I know that I'm a good person. Confidence. I know that I've got stuff to share and it allows me to block all that stuff out. Mm. Because again, it's all, you know, every, everything like that, that the, the people would think, it's all lies anyway, they don't know me. And now I've come to terms with the fact that it's okay if people that don't really know me think I'm something I'm not, it doesn't bother me. Because I know for a fact, 100%, if they were in a room with me, they would fall in fucking love with me. I know it, right? And 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 then you start looking at it from their point of view as well. And because most of the shit, when people are giving you hate and slagging you off and doing all this stuff and that negativity, you then realise that actually it's because they've got some shit going on. Yeah. Like they've got Very some. Security. Think about the person, right? That's on Facebook. I say that because I run a lot of ads, right? So I get a lot of hate on my ads and stuff. On Facebook, they watch a video, like for three minutes, a video of me for three minutes. And then they comment saying, really, mate, I've been called a I've been called a prick, a scammer, all of this stuff in the comments. Think about what that, per that, that person's headspace is like to do that. I would never do that. If I saw an ad where I thought someone was, it was dodgy or scam, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't waste my time commenting on, on it. I, I haven't got the time you know, to, to, to comment and get angry about it. Now, I, they've seen an ad of me. Now, their day, they're all angry and worked up in their house. I picture them, like, walking around the kitchen. Oh, fucking Matt Wilson guy. I've just, it's like, mate, what are you doing? Like, you've got a life to live. Don't fucking write and comment on me and working yourself up and getting yourself angry about me. Go and 
Go and help yourself. Go and do something good for yourself, you know? So then you get into a, like, a bit of pity for them because, you know, it is, it's, a, it's a weird thing, man. Online, you know, online hate and trolls and stuff. They've, a lot of yeah, people have got a lot of shit going on in their head. And when you, but when you realise that, it's easy to get over. You're like, now I just look at them. Sometimes I even reply. I was like, mate, you're all right. You're having a bad day. Like, yeah, do you want to talk? You know, because... Yeah, some some of them have just yeah got get they get really angry. So mate, it's a fucking ad. Like with EMC, for example, the event it's an event, right? It's a live event that people pay for a ticket and then they come and they learn some great stuff. And there's, there's people on the ads and it's like biggest scam in history. And I, I was like, you know what the fuck? It's an event, man. You come in, you pay, pay like you go to see a gig. These guys are paying to come and see and learn about business. Where's the scam? Like, I don't understand how I'm scamming them. They're going to come to a live event and get what they've paid for. How's it a scam? And they're just like, Ugh. just because they're just angry. They don't like to see anyone doing well because they're not doing well. Yeah. That's what it all boils it down to. insecurity as well, doesn't it? Oh, massive insecurities. Yeah, yeah. Ma- that's, that's why, no joke, uh, This and this is a fact, 80% of people that comment shit, their face isn't their profile picture. I've seen water bottles. I've seen shoes. I've seen cars, a big one, cats, right? That's their profile picture. They, they're they calling me a scammer. They ain't even got a fucking picture on their profile. It's like, what world are we living in here? You know? But yeah, anyway, that was a bit of a rant. I saw, I saw a video tangent. the other day that was basically just saying, you never see, if, if you were to go play basketball, you never see an NBA player hating on you playing basketball. Yeah. And if you are a top businessman, you're never going to hate on someone who's looking to start a business. 100%. And that's just because these guys and girls are hating because they're not doing it. They're not anything. doing it. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, because they're telling themselves that the reason they're not doing it is because everyone that's doing it are scammers. And they've got, they've got, they've, they've anchored all of this negativity to doing something good. You know, it's the, the classic example is, you know, you see a really nice car in a garage, like a pull up, you know, Ferrari, for example, immediately you think that person's a drug dealer or their dad's rich. All you're doing is telling your subconscious that to get a Ferrari, you've got to be a drug dealer or your dad's got to be rich. That's all you're doing. You're, you're, you're training your subconscious to believe that that's the case. So you're never going to go out and get it because, again, the subconscious is so powerful over years and years and years of you telling yourself that, you can now no, no longer get a Ferrari because your brain now thinks that to get Ferrari is bad. You have to be bad to have that, which means you'll never get it. You know, rather than opening up and saying, how did he get that? I wonder. You know, and going up and speaking to him and asking him how he got it. What'd you do? How'd you do it? You know, all that sort of yeah, stuff. It's, it's just totally different mentality. How long would you say it took you from start to finish to get to the starting point where you were then and to the point where you think, actually, I don't care anymore and I'm, I'm content with where I'm at? Um, in terms of what people think and stuff. Well, it's in terms of like years, months, whatever, from a starting point where you go, I need, just, I need to make a change here. And where you just, you, you knew you'd completed it, where you go, I don't care anymore. I am I am where I am, I'm happy and I'm content. Oh, mate, I, I've never, I, I'm, not, I'm not there yet. Oh, no, 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 yeah, yeah. Don't misunderstand me. Well, you know, entrepreneurship is a disease, unfortunately. And, it, and, it, and it's an uncurable disease. You, our brains are wired differently. We can't stop, you know, I, if I, I've reached, I've reached countless goals over the years. I've failed at loads, but countless goals, and it, all that happens is immediately you look for the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. I've actually got to, this this staircase here on my tattoo. This is actually to represent that. I was trying to think is like that's how I look at it. It's just a never ending fucking staircase. Like there is no top. Even the thing, guys that you think are at the top, that 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 that, that ain't their top. Their top's fucking way above mm, that. You look at millionaires, they're trying to be tens millionaires, hundred millionaires, billionaires. Billionaires are trying to be trillionaires. Doesn't stop. We're wired differently. You know, entrepreneurs, they, we, we can never settle. We can, nothing is ever good enough because that's the way we're wired. And sometimes it's exhausting. Um, you know, I look, I've said this a few times actually, I look at people that are very, very happy in life and content doing just a normal job. And I envy him sometimes. Mm. Like my brother's a great example. He's a teacher. Ha- he's just the happiest person I've ever met. He's completely content. No ambition, like it's a teacher, right? So there's not really much ambition you can have, maybe to be a head teacher, but it's not really much ambition you can have, but he's happy doing it. Which means he can go to work, he can come home, and he can put his feet up and switch off. I can't do that. I'm at work or I'm at home, wherever I am, I'm constantly ticking, tick, 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 tick. I'm always thinking about what I can do next, how I can do more, how I can reach more people, how I can do all this stuff. And it's exhausting. But that's 
what we have to put up with to have the life that we have, to get the things that we have, to see the places that we have, to meet the people that I have. That's what we've got to sacrifice is that contentness. Mm. And it's never going to come. So are you able to switch off at any point? Not really. No, not, all, not no. holidays, no. Holidays, sometimes I can. I mean, you know, give me like, maybe it'll take me a couple of days though. So holidays, yeah, yeah. it's a little bit easier for me because I've got kids and they keep me very busy. So after, but again, but still, it'll take me three, four, five days to really? switch off. And even then, you know, I've got employees, we've got business, whatever. It's Even then, there's messages it's coming in. I'm, you know, I'm never, I'm never fully switched mm. off. You know, because as well, as well, I'm a massive learner. So I'm always, any sort of spare time, I write, what can I read? What can I learn? What can I sort of digest to get better? Always trying to get better. Um, and yeah, I talk about it, I've spoke about it a few times, actually. It's a really interesting sort of, you know, concept that, that, that sort of employee, because it's weird, like employees, a lot of the time they look at people that have got like businesses and they're, you know, doing all that and they've got money and they're like, oh yeah, that'd be great to be like that. But, you know, mate, the grass ain't always greener. There's shit that comes with being like this. Mm. Yeah, okay, we get the, you know, we get the cars and we get the money and we get the respect and all that sort of stuff, but we do not switch off. It's exhausting sometimes. Mm. What I was going to say, you, when you brought the speakers to EMC, predominantly all, you know, brilliant entrepreneurs who made a load of money. Yeah. When you're talking with these people who have networked with them, are they in a similar mindset to you of sort of just like, can't switch off yeah next goal is that like a similar trait between them all yeah it's it's it's, it's wired into every entrepreneur mate it's the entrepreneur's thing going back but i had it i've always had it you guys have got it i've always had it since we we're at school that's what that's what fucking adhd is yeah. that's it we can't i'm doing something and then either I, something shinier comes up and then i'll switch and have another idea or constantly thinking or i'll get something done and straight away i'm into the next thing What's really important to do, I think, and I only again I only started doing this a couple of years ago because again I'm self aware and that conversation we just had about you know not being able to switch off and stuff like that. It's really really important sometimes. Every now and then, you know, where I, I do it in the sauna a lot, right? I just sit there, just gratitude, just think about everything you are thankful for because the problem is with it, you're always looking forward, so you're always on a starting line. That's how it feels. It's all you're always on a starting line. What you should do, if I look back from when I was 18, it's like the difference is massive. It's enormous, you know. And But because I'm always looking forward at that next thing, I'm always in a mindset of, oh, you know, I haven't even got there yet. I'm not even doing that yet. So every now and then it's good to look back and just be like, fucking, but look how far you've already come. Mm. And that makes you feel a lot better and a lot more yeah. positive. And it, I think that's very, very important because you can get, you know, I hate the word depressed, not depressed, but you can sort of get a little bit, you know, down yeah, if you're sure. constantly focusing on what you haven't got yet. Yeah. Because that's, that's what that is. The, the thing in front of you is, is strip everything away. It's something you haven't got. Mm -hmm. And if you're constantly focusing on something you haven't got, you're never going to appreciate what you have got. It's funny because I spoke to my dad the other day and he was like, you know, we're quite a tough love family. Like we don't go around being like, you're amazing, you're amazing. And he was just like, listen, everyone at the moment saying you're doing really well and stuff out and like, it put me in an awful headspace <coughs> and I just felt like it's such a bad headspace to be in when I myself feel like I'm so far behind but everyone's telling you you're doing so well yeah and that's quite a scary headspace to be in it's kind of just expanding on the point which you said is like I, I don't feel satisfied in what I'm doing I have to keep going yeah even though everyone's being like mate you're doing amazing like this podcast it's great and the stuff I'm doing behind the scenes is looking great and that's that's a pretty horrible place to be in, and I'm sure one that you're you've been in as well. Yeah, I think, it, but it's good to be like that. I, I don't, again, that's just the way you're wired, mate. You know, you're the same as me. You're never going to get that. But like I said, that's why it's important to look back. You know, it's definitely good to be like that. I mean, you've you've always got to be honest with yourself. Don't bullshit yourself about how well you are doing. You know, I've been like it. I'm like it with rugby. Rugby is a great example as well. I never think I play well, ever. I get off the pitch and everyone's like, yeah, mate, you amazing. did all this. And I was like, man, all I think about is the shit that I did wrong that I can do better next time. I don't focus on it. And I'm like that with anything I do, with the event. All I'm doing at that event, you know, it, it, you say it's amazing, all this. All I'm looking at is everything that's shit about it. I'm like, this has got to change. There's nothing wrong with that because that's how we get better. That's like, that's that's honesty. That's, you know, that's being um, self-aware and honest of the reality. 
And there's nothing wrong with that. That's how champions are made, you know, taking on that feedback, trying to get better. Because the other side of the coin is delusion. Whereas, oh yeah, I am great and all this sort of stuff. This is what I used to do. When I was, again, late teens, I, I didn't want to learn anything because I thought I knew it all. You know, no one could tell me anything because, uh, yeah, again, I just thought I knew it all. And someone that thinks they know it all can never, ever get better. If someone does something wrong and they don't take responsibility for it and say, yeah, I fucked up there um, and this is what I can do better next time, that person's never getting any better. That's one of the worst character traits you can have in an employee, for example. I don't care if someone fucks up at all. It's good to make mistakes. It's how you learn. Mm -hmm. But you come to me and say, oh, yeah, but it's this person's fault. Or that. No, no, it's your responsibility. It doesn't matter whose fault it is. As a manager... You know, I, I used to get, it's the most painful thing to do. When I was running a company before as a manager, it was the most painful thing to do. Something goes wrong that someone underneath me did. It's completely their fault. I can't then go to my boss at the time and tell him that, oh yeah, no, it was his fault down there. He mm. fucked up. That's bad leadership. That's on me. That He's my responsibility. So whatever he does wrong is my responsibility. So I have to tell him that it's my fault. Mm. What bad leaders do, and this is where you get people like hating on management and hating on managers and all this, is they're snitches. So they, if they, that person there fucks up, they'll go to the boss and say, yeah, mate, it was him. Fucking get rid of him. He's rubbish. You know, bad leader. That, that whole team now are not going to trust this person ever because all they think is, yeah, if something goes wrong, you're not going to have my back. Mm -hmm. How people follow you, if people follow you into battle, follow you at work, whatever, on a team, captain of a rugby team or whatever, is because they know when it comes down to it, you're going to have their back. Mm. That's one of the most important characteristics of a leader. And that's how you show it, by right. taking responsibility for shit. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm going to give that guy a bollocking. Mm. And he's going to learn to not do that again. But I cannot tell that person that it's his fault. Mm. Yeah? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I'm, I'm wary of time. Yeah, no worries, studio, man. But I, I'd yeah. love to end it on these two questions. Yeah, it's, go for it. Um, what's the plan for you? over the next five to 10 years? I know you're constantly step after step growing, but wh where do you see yourself in five to 10 years time, personally and in sort of business life as well? Yeah, I mean, um, well, personally, best shape of my life. You know, one of my big goals, as soon as I get this angle operation, I wanna, I wanna get into ridiculous shape and be like 38, 39 and just be like six packed up, you know? <laughs> so that, that personally there, just, be, just being able to run and just, just be fit and healthy. But main goal always, right? Be a good dad and all that sort of stuff. Business-wise, obviously EMC, that's a bit of a passion project. You know, five years, I probably would have sold it, hopefully, by then. You know, yeah. sold it. Um, you know, multi eight-figure exit is what we're going to go for for that event. Yeah, for sure. Uh, agency ticking over nicely. My team's still there. Me probably out of the business and doing more stuff like working with other businesses. What I love is like going into another business, helping them, strategize with them, and just helping grow other companies as well. You know, I'd love so once my business is at the stage where I can completely step out, EMC's done the same. You know, what I'd love to do if I had millions in the bank. That's what I'd do. I'd go, I'd be approaching companies, doing deals with them. Look, get me on the board. Get bring me in as a shareholder. And then working with them from like a strategic point of view, because that's what I like, love doing, that sort of stuff. Mate, I love that. Awesome. The last question I'm going to end it on is, if you could give anyone advice who is currently on a similar path to you were and doubting themselves at 17, 18, maybe even at 20 working in a factory, what would you say to them? What advice would you give them? Um, don't compare, because the only, the only reason people are like that at that age is because they're comparing themselves to someone more successful, more rich, older. Don't compare to anybody, you know, just focus on yourself. Um, don't care what anyone thinks at that point and then and be patient as well. When you're 20, you think that you've got to have everything figured out by 20. I still haven't got any for everything figured out. I'm 37, you know, and if, if I could go back and tell 18 year old Matt, 19 year old Matt, 20 year old Matt, just be more patient. Like mate, there's, you've got so much time. Learn, take this time, especially in your 20s while you've got loads of energy um, to, to learn everything you can. But, you know, the most important thing is, is, is don't let things that aren't actually important get to you. And normally that is what you haven't got or what somebody else has. Yeah. Unreal. Awesome, mate, mate, what a pleasure. Thank you so much. No worries, man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you.